Okay, so this session is called uh, Quills and Frills, um, and it's all about the Tudors. We decided to do about the Tudors today because um, I'm sure you know it's the Queen's Platinum Jubilee coming up. And here in Gloucestershire, we have lots of links to the royal family over the generations. And we've got two particularly beautiful royal charters that we're going to be showing you towards the end of this presentation. But we've got some other things that we're going to do first. Um, so to join in this session, um, you will need the Passport to the Past um, resources for today's session. If you haven't got them, don't worry. You can just join in with a pencil and paper um, and, hard, and a hard surface to lean on. But you might want to have a look at those later because we've got lots of um, activities to do with the Tudors, which you could have a look at if you haven't seen them already. So we always start off by having a big hello um, and all saying hello at the same time. So if you take yourself off mute, and um, give us a big wave if your camera's off, uh, if your camera's on, and we'll say hello, welcome everybody. Hello, hello. give us a wave. Hello. Smashing, okay. So what are we going to be doing? We're going to be finding out a little bit about who the Tudors were. Now, most um, children learn about the Tudors in school, so we're going to be finding out what you already know and perhaps giving you a little bit more knowledge. We're going to be meeting a very special person. We've got a special guest today. He's called Medicus John and he is a Tudor barber surgeon. Now a barber surgeon was a sort of doctor. He did operations. He was also a dentist. He helped people who had, were having problems with their teeth and also was a barber, did haircuts as well. So he had quite a wide range of skills. We're going to be looking at the beautiful Tudor Charter, which I mentioned earlier. Um, and we're going to also be looking at some Tudor portraits of um, Henry VIII and Elizabeth I. And you'll have a chance to create your own portrait too. So who were the Tudors? Well, the Tudors were the royal family um, between 1485 and 1603, so roughly 500 years ago. The first one was um, Henry VII, and this is a picture of Henry VII here. Um, it, and the, the Tudor period took its name from Henry. He was called Henry Tudor, Henry VII. Um, he was the first of the Tudor kings. The people who lived in his lifetime became known as the Tudors. So if you were king or queen, what would the age be called? My, my, name, my surname is O'Keefe, so if I was Queen Kate, um, my subjects would be called the O'Keefeans, and the, it would be the O'Keefe age, the great age of O'Keefe. So he, this is a picture that you might recognise. Do anyone know who this picture is? Do you recognise this very fancily dressed person. Well, this is Queen. Ah, oh, go on, Rose. Queen Elizabeth. Yeah, absolutely right. Well done. That's Queen Elizabeth the first. So at the moment on the throne we have Queen Elizabeth the second, don't we? But this is Queen Elizabeth the first. She was the daughter of King Henry the eighth. Um, so during the Tudor age, there were five kings and queens. We had Henry VII, Henry VIII, Edward VI, Mary I and Elizabeth I. And Henry VIII and Elizabeth I were the, the most famous ones and they're still very famous today and known throughout the world. So King Henry VIII is very famous for all kinds of things. One of them is how many wives he had. So. I'll answer my own question here. He had six wives um, and there was a very famous sea battle that was fought and won during the reign of Elizabeth I. And again, I'm going to answer the question. It was the Battle of the Spanish Armada. And if you look at that portrait that was painted of her at the time, you can see um, just behind that sort of draped cloth that's behind her, the artist has put in a picture of the Spanish Armada battle because that was a very, very big event that happened during her reign. And the Queens Elizabeth I and Mary I were the very first queens to rule in their own right. So they were the first women who had that power. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about eating and drinking. Food and drink was very important to the Tudors and as with everything, they used it to show how wealthy they were. They were a very, very show-offy um, 
people. All Tudors ate porridge, so rich Tudors <coughs> and poor Tudors ate pottage, and pottage was a mixture of grains and water. It was a little bit like porridge. The, the closest that we have to it today would be probably porridge. And they added other ingredients. So poor people added things that they could get their hands on, like vegetables and herbs. Rich people would add things like red wine, meat, and spices. Everyone ate bread. Poor or servants would eat the, the bottom part of the bread, which was quite often burnt because it was baked on the floor of the oven. Rich people ate the top bit of the bread, and rich people are still called the upper crust because of this happening all those years ago. So the water in Tudor times was often dirty and contaminated and could make you ill. <coughs> Excuse me. So most people drank beer instead. I'm going to have a little sip of water. I haven't got beer in here. This is just water. So most people drank beer. Beer was safer because the water used to make it had been boiled, so the bacteria had been killed. People didn't know that that's why the beer was safer to drink. They didn't know it was the boiling that made the water safer, but they just realized that beer was a safer drink. And even children um, drank beer, and, and, but the beer that they drank was very weak. It was called small beer. It wasn't strong beer. So the Tudors didn't have cutlery like we do today. Um, every person had their own knife and spoon. Sp forks weren't invented yet. And they carried the spoon and, and knife with them wherever they went. Um, spoons were often given as gifts. And a child at a christening today still sometimes gets a spoon as a christening gift. Um, Tudor tables were called trestle tables, which meant that the top was just balanced on the legs. It wasn't fixed to the legs. And that's why we're still told not to put our elbows on the table today. Because in Tudor times, if you put your elbows on the table and you leant on the table, put your weight on the table, the table would collapse towards you and you get everything spilling into your lap. So a little bit now about pastimes, what Tudor people used to do. Um, they had lots of games and sports. Lots of them were very cruel and violent. We wouldn't allow them today at all. <coughs> Football was popular during the Tudor age. Um, Henry VIII tried to ban it because it took up, people were so interested in it, it meant that they weren't, sometimes they weren't working or doing other skills that they should have been doing. Um, it was very different from today. So there was no limit to the number of people you could have on each side. So nowadays it's 11 people on a team, isn't it, for a football team. In those days you could have as many people as you wanted. The goals could be as much as a mile apart. You could pick up and throw the ball as well as kicking it. And the ball was either made of a pig's bladder, which has blown up like a balloon, or made of leather and packed with straw. Um, competitors could be seriously hurt or even killed playing football. And we've got a little quote here from somebody um, from the time. Football is more of a fight than a game. Sometimes their necks are broken, sometimes their backs, sometimes their legs. Football encourages envy and hatred. Sometimes fighting, murder, and a great loss of blood. So it wasn't like today's game. It was a much more violent affair. And we're going to be looking at another couple of violent things that the Tudors enjoyed that we wouldn't enjoy today. So things which were called blood sports, you might have heard of these, cockfighting and bear baiting, which were very, very cruel to animals. Bear baiting would involve um, chaining a bear to a post and setting some dogs on it. Um, <laughs> People used to also go to executions. So when criminals um, were punished, their executions would often be in public and people would go and watch that as an entertainment, including children. So it's very, very different from, uh, from what we would do today. So they played um, bowls, which is like a, a game where you roll a big ball across the grass, fox and geese, dice cards, and a game called real tennis, which was a bit more like the game of squash that we have today. Um, and there were various attempts to ban these games, but Tudors continued to play them. And it is said that Anne Boleyn, who was one of Henry VIII's six wives, was watching a game of tennis when she was arrested. And it was also been said that her husband, Henry VIII, was playing tennis when he was brought the news that she'd been executed. And Francis Drake was said to be playing a game of bowls by the seaside when he heard about the approach of the Spanish fleet, the, the Spanish Armada, who were coming to attack 
um, Britain. Only middle class boys went to school in Tudor times. Girls had a couple of years at school and after that they stayed at home and they were taught the skills that needed to run a house and look after a family. <coughs> Poor boys didn't need to go to school because their family needed them to go out to, to work. They were needed at home and to, to earn money. Wealthy boys stayed at home and they had a tutor. They went to university at the age of 14. We've got some interesting facts coming up. Uh, so both the queens, future queens, Elizabeth and Mary, had the same education as the wealthy boys. So they learned many subjects, including mathematics, languages, music, music and classics. It was, it was very, very unusual for girls at that time. So they would have had the same level of education as the wealthy boys that they knew. Boys would take beer to school. It would be that weak beer, the small beer. That's what they drank when they were at school. And the future kings had somebody called a whipping boy, which sounds very unfair to us. So because if the, ki if the prince was naughty, it was thought wrong for one of his subjects to punish him. So the prince would have another child, a whipping boy, who took his punishment for him. And although this seems extremely unfair to us, whipping boys usually grew up to have important um, roles in the court of the king. So um, there, were, there were good reasons for doing it. Now, in a minute, I'm going to introduce you to our special guest today, um, Medicus John, the Tudor barber surgeon. So he's going to tell you a little bit about some of the cures that um, he uses to treat people who are ill. You'll be quite surprised, I should think, to hear about some of these cures and probably a little bit shocked as well. Um, so are, are you ready, Medicus John? I certainly am. Right. I certainly am. Over to you. Thank you. Well, hello there, Rose. You all right? So what I'm going to talk to you about, I'm just going to show you some of the things that the Tudors did if they were ill. Now, I've got this silly hat on and this sort of jacket. This is like sort of the, sort of the uniform that a surgeon, Tudor surgeon, would wear. So how could you protect yourself? Well, there are some ways you could do it. One of the best ways was using something like this. Okay, this is called a tuzzy muzzy, and it was supposed to be lots of nice herbs and flowers wrapped up. You need to keep it about your person, and if you were walking down the street and you smelt something really nasty, you could take it out and, and sniff it, and they thought it would protect you because they thought illness and disease was floating on the air, and they gave it a little name called the miasma. So this would be good if you were a very poor person, you'd have one of these. If I was a little bit more well off, I would have one of those. And you might recognize that from Christmas time. Okay, it's called a pomander. Okay, and what it is, it's an orange and it's studded with cloves and rolled in some spices like cinnamon and nutmeg. And it smells absolutely lovely. And so it worked in the same way, except with these, you could hang it around your neck. And as the smell was always there, you wouldn't become ill because they thought it would protect you. If you were really, really rich though, you could use one of these. And this is called a pomander, and this is made of metal or silver, and inside it there are lots of lovely things like perfume balls, there are flower petals, and again, you would put it around your neck and wear it so you'd be protected from illness 24-7, 365 days a year. And that's how they thought they would look after themselves and keep themselves well. They had lots of little cures. Nobody could really afford to go to a surgeon like me unless you were really rich. So the, most people had what they called hedgerow medicine. So they'd go out in the, in the countryside and find all the herbs that they thought would help them. And I don't know, have you ever had earache? If you had earache, there was a special cure they, they could do with it. So what you'd do if you had earache, you'd go out in the countryside and you would find yourself alive, one of those, which is a snail. Okay, so what they would do, they would take a knife, turn the snail upside down, prick its foot until all the juices were coming out of it and then they would pour it in the person who had the earache's ear and i don't know about you but i don't think that would work but they did and one of the reasons they thought they did is if you have a look inside a snail shell it curls you have to look inside in somebody's ear and that curls and they thought because they were similar they must work the same way and because the snail was always healthy and happy they would use that the snails were also very good if you had a cough. Because if you had a cough, they would do the same thing. They would prick the foot of the snail and you'd have to 
swallow all the juices and they thought that would make you better and you might think that's really crazy and the reason they did that is because when the snails go along the ground they leave behind a slime trail and if you've had a bad cough for a while <coughs> you're coughing up nasty things and it looks like slime and they thought well the snails getting rid of its slime and it's not coughing so if i eat the snail or drink it i won't cough so that's how they thought amazing isn't it now, another really, really common problem that people often get is, is earache. Okay, there are lots of things you do. I've just shown you the snail, but there was more. I could cure your earache by using this. That's a piece of bacon. Isn't that strange? So what they would do, they would cut off the fat of the bacon, take the bacon fat, and they would stuff it in the person's ear who had earache. Leave it in there for about ooh, three or four days, perhaps. And then they would put it out and the person would be cured. And do you know what's really strange? That actually works. That actually works because bacon flat fat dissolves earwax. And it's usually earwax that gives you a lot of pain in your ears, especially if you're young or old. But there are lots of other things they could do. Um, how did they find out what was wrong with you? Well, this is quite an interesting one. So if you went to a Tudor medicine, if you could afford it like me, he'd just ask you lots of questions. How are you? What have you been doing? Where does it hurt? Things like that. But he could also diagnose you. Okay. And he'd do this in a number of ways. And one of the most effective ways would be to use this. And this is a person's we. So what the Tudor surgeon would do, he would have a look at it. What colour is it? Because that could be vastly different. And if you can see back here on my thing, there's a chart on there, and it's got lots of different colours that we could be, and they all could mean something. Okay. But he would also have to have a little, little sniff, because that could sometimes pretend you what was wrong. And if you really got complicated and you really didn't know, you might have to have a little... Oh yes, that's oh, oh yes, that's that's very nasty. It's black bile, I think. So he could use that. Once he'd done that, he would also use what we think today is magic, but at the Tudor's time they thought it was medical science. They would use astrology. So they thought the position of the sun and the moon and the stars in the sky could have a bearing on why you were ill, what was making you ill, and even how or when they could treat you. So they used a combination of all these things to see if you could see if they could make you better again. Okay. Now, okay, how long have we got? A couple more minutes? Okay. So lots of things we could do. Um, do you ever get headaches? If you've got headaches and you came to me, I'll prescribe you some of this. Now, that is the bark of a tree. Okay, it's not any old tree. It's a special tree. It's an ash tree, and it has a large amount of what today we call aspirin. And they would literally just get somebody, say ash, it's willow, sorry, and you'd chew it, break it off, and you'd chew it because there's an ingredient in it which is the same as aspirin. Now, it might sound crazy, but I knew an old man when I was a boy on a farm, if he had a headache, he would always go to these trees, break a bit of bark off and chew them. It was, sounds crazy to us, but that's what he used to do. There are lots of other things we can do for medical people as well to help them. And here's a very good one. Nice piece of cheese. Okay. So if you ever had a runny bottom, okay, and you've been sick all the time, what they would do, they would take a piece of cheese, they would get a jug with some milk in it, they would scrape off all the mould into the milk, warm it up the milk, and then drink it. Okay, and you might think, that's crazy. But today, one of our most powerful medicines, penicillin, comes from a cheese mould. So had these people accidentally discovered a modern medicine? Okay. How are we doing? That hasn't been fine? No, fine for a few more minutes. Right, so do you hope you do clean your teeth? I'm sure you do. I'm sure you do. This is how you clean your teeth in Tudor times. You'd use a nice stick, dip it in some of your small beer, and literally just go around like that. They knew they cleaned their teeth, they didn't leave it, but they thought they could become ill because of the bad breath. Do you remember what I said about when they used to sniff these? It was because of the bad air. And they thought if you had smelly breath, okay, you would get toothache. 
So they could make lots of potions to help you clean your teeth. And one of the best ones, you can take some mint, okay, and you can make some salt, and you can take some sage, which they would put in stuffing for roast turkeys and roast chickens. You mix that all together, you dry it out, bake it in the oven, and then it becomes all crumbly, and you can crumble it into a powder. And then you would actually get your toothbrush, dip it in the mint, and do this. Or you could dip your finger in it and clean it out like that. And they thought that was really, really good. But another really good way, if they got really bad toothache, they could use one of these. And this one's a bit scary, to be honest. So they would take a candle, they would light it so it's burning, they'd find the tooth where the her pain was, and then they'd hold the candle under it. Ah, ah, and they would th thought it would burn it away. Why did they do that, do you think? Well, they thought that every little tooth had a little beast in it called a toothworm. And they thought, if it got a toothache, it's because the toothworm had eaten his way out of your tooth and has gone to eat all the dead, rotting food around the rest of your mouth. So they thought, if you've got toothache, you kill the toothworm. Amazing, isn't it? But you might think people got, forget, forgot about that sort of thing. But we have another fantastic cure, which we have here in the archives, and it uses that. It's difficult, difficult to see, but that is a nail, a normal nail that you put in wood. And we have a cure in 1700s where a man had really bad toothache it was so bad he wanted his friend to shoot him okay until another friend said no you can solve it by using this so what you do is you take this nail you find the bad tooth you scratch it until the tooth starts to bleed then you take that nail go to a tree and bang the nail in the tree do you know what that worked as well but it was only for a very special medicine. We think that one was because somebody had what they call an abscess under the tooth, which is really painful. But we had this, they thought it worked. So you had lots of also old wives tales. People would go out because they believed things would work. And if you believe something's gonna work, nine times out of 10, it does. Okay, catch you later. <laughs> Uh, could we have one question for you, John? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, could you let us know what um, uh, what happened to people who have a headache? Headache. Well, if they had a headache, they would try this. Okay, if that didn't work, you might have to do something more serious. So they might have to do an operation which they called trepanning. And that was a hole in the head. They'd actually drill a hole in your head. Okay, and to do this, they would take their imagine this is a live person. I'd have him on my lap. I would get a knife and I would cut like that and I peel back the skin so he looks a bit like a banana or a baked potato okay and then I would take one of these and this is like a drill so what this would do you could put this on the head and you could drill a hole all right this here would actually make a hole in your head like that so that's quite big and what they thought this would do, they thought this would let all the badness out. They also used it if somebody had fallen over and smashed their head or been hit with a big hammer or a sword, they could do this operation. Okay, so they would do that, but all they would actually do, they wouldn't poke around in there. Oh, they would just look at it, wash it out with a bit of, a bit of wee is quite good in there, a right, bit of beer, clean it up, and they would take the bit of bone they'd cut out, pop it back in, pull the skin back together, and then simply sew it up sew all the head back up and again did it work we don't know but what's amazing was that it was quite a successful and that a lot of people actually survived that operation we find these skulls with holes in the heads every now and then and it's estimated that about 50 percent survived it so that was the most extreme cure for a headache that we know luckily today we can just go and chew on a piece of bark or chew on an aspirin or a neurofen or something like that how's that is that okay Thank you, Medicus John. That's lovely. Has anybody got any more questions uh, for Medicus John before he goes back to his job of curing people? All right. Well, thank you very much for that. That was very interesting. I can't believe anyone would survive that having a hole drilled in their skull. It seems incredible. Um, so we're going to have a quick look at a couple of Tudor portraits now. So um, portraits of that of King Henry VIII. Um, you can see him here, um, and also one of um, Queen Elizabeth I. So here we have King Henry VIII. So just looking at the portrait, does anybody like to say, what do you notice 
about King Henry? How does he strike you in that portrait? You can put it in the chat if you like, or um, come off, uh, put your camera on for a little minute so that we can see. Okay, well, the first thing that um, I notice is the way he's standing. So he's got his legs apart, hasn't he? He's got his arms, um, his hands on his hips. It makes him look bigger. He looks very big and imposing. He's not smiling, is he? He looks, um, he looks stern. He looks serious. Um, so he, we, he's, he's, he, he looks big. We can tell he's very wealthy. How can we tell that? Well, obviously look at what he's wearing he's he's got jewels um he's covered in gold all the clothes he's wearing are very ornate and um, have got embroidery on them he's got a wall hanging behind him that is embroidered he's standing on a very um rich carpet all these things show how important he is Gemma, did you want to say something oh just to say that um Rafi has put into chat that he's royal and he is wearing expensive clothes exactly right yeah you can see he looks very regal he's wearing extremely expensive clothes um now shapely legs apparently were considered to be a sign of attractiveness in um tudor times and you can see he's got very he's got little ankles but very very well developed calves so he was considered to be a very attractive man um do you think you'd be scared of him if you met him look at the expression on his face does he look friendly you think of our queen today when she goes out and about meeting the people she's very smiley isn't she she's very smiley and approachable and friendly henry didn't want to seem like that he wanted to seem fierce and stern and for people to feel a little bit afraid of him and i think that's what's been captured in this portrait here um, so the next one we're going to look at and i'll just give you a couple of minutes to look at it before i say anything um, and this is called the rainbow portrait of Elizabeth I, and it's called the Rainbow Portrait for a particular reason, which I'll come on to. But if you can just have a look, look very carefully at her gown, and particularly at the sleeve, which we can see, and then at the gold colored cloth, have a look at that and see if you can spot anything on there that's quite unusual. Okay. So, she's very fashionable she's wearing all the fashions of the time so richly embroidered cloth so can you see that she has that lacy um rough um and um lace around her head and neck um she's wearing a lot of jewelry um, she has very sort of puffy sleeves on her on her um dress Obviously, she's very, very rich, and we can see that from the crown and all the jewels she's wearing. She's young and beautiful, isn't she? Have a look at her face. She doesn't look at all wrinkled, does she? She has a very smooth, unblemished skin in this portrait. She looks very beautiful. So she's wearing a crown. Obviously, this tells us that she's the queen. Now, did anybody spot the snake? on the sleeve of her gown. So the sleeve that we can see, that's the one towards us, has a snake embroidered on it. And that symbol, um, symbolizes wisdom. So in um, Tudor times, a snake um, was associated with wisdom. So on the cloth here of her dress, did you notice the embroidered eyes and ears? You might have to look quite closely, but the eyes and ears have been embroidered onto the cloth of this dress and that's to symbolize that Elizabeth can see and hear everything she's very powerful she's wearing a very long rope of pearls a very long pearl necklace and that's to symbolize purity and the frills up here around her neck neck and head make her look like an angel now this that she's holding in her hand here it doesn't look like a rainbow to us but this is a rainbow. This is why this is called the rainbow portrait, because she's holding a rainbow and the rainbow symbolizes peace. What do we think the reality was like? So this is a, an actress in the 1970s playing the part 
of Elizabeth I um, in, a, in a drama for television. And what we know was that that portrait, which we just were looking at of Elizabeth, was actually painted towards the end of her life. She was in her late 60s when that was painted, so she was an old woman. Most people didn't live nearly as long as that in Tudor times, so in Tudor times she was a very, very old lady. Um, so she, her skin wouldn't have been as smooth and as perfect as we saw in the portrait. We know she only had a few teeth left and that those teeth were rotten. As we've heard from Medicus John, people didn't have the same ways of looking after their teeth as we do today. Her face was disfigured by smallpox. She had scars on her skin. We know this because she had an illness called smallpox when she was younger. And she, like a lot of people in the court, a lot of the rich people, used a um, a paint that was made of lead, a, a white paint that made their skin look very white to hide the scars. And actually they didn't know that, but we know now that lead is very, very toxic. It's very, very bad for people. So it would have made their skin even worse. Um, so the dress that she was wearing, her bodice and her skirts would give her a very curvy look to her figure. We know that she is wearing a wig. And it got us thinking about social media and how we all like to change the way that we look on social media. So nowadays we can use filters, can't we? Or we would certainly choose a picture of ourselves that we thought was a flattering one, that one that we thought we looked nice in. So we are going to give you just a couple of minutes now, if you if you've, um, have some things with you, some pencils and papers, if you, if you don't, we'll give you a minute to go and find some things and just do a very quick portrait of yourself as a Tudor king or queen. We'll come back to you in three minutes. We'd like you to show us what you've made. Okay, we'll give you one more minute um, to finish off your portraits. And then if you would be kind enough to put on your cameras and hold them up, we'd love to see them. Doesn't matter if you haven't done one, but if you have, we'd love to see. Okay, one more minute. So has anyone done a portrait? Doesn't look like it. We, we've got as far as the frame. <laughs> oh, shall we? <laughs> 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 Let's give you another few minutes then. We don't want to rush the, any artistic work that's happening.
How are you doing, Rose? Are you ready? Can we see? You didn't have very much time, did you? Hello. Oh, that is magnificent. Oh, look at that beautiful frame. <laughs> So hopefully you'll be able to finish these off. And that is, so Rafi, you've done yourself looking extremely commanding, large, impressive. Anyone I think, are you smiling? Let me have another look. Are you smiling in that portrait or are you looking stern like Henry VIII? Mm -hmm. You're looking stern. Right, shall we move on? So we're going to talk a little bit now about what Tudors wore. We've already seen what the rich, the very richest people wore, um, which was a fancy clothes to make them look impressive and to show off. And of course, we still dress today to show off, don't we? So if you've ever watched something like the Oscars ceremonies, um, you will see that people wearing very, very fancy dresses, lots of jewellery, expensive watches, those kinds of things. So we're not that different from the Tudors. We like to show off as well. Um, some interesting things, um, only rich, the very richest people were allowed to wear clothes made out of silk and only people in the royal family were allowed to wear the colour purple. Um, poor people obviously needed clothes that were practical, things that they could move around in and work in and things which kept them warm. Um, so their clothes were usually made out of wool and they were very simple. The colours were dull. They wouldn't have had any of the frills and decorations like the rich people's outfits. Um, so for, for poor people, fashion was a lot less important than having clothes which were, were strong and robust and would last for a long time. Their clothes tended to be quite loose fitting. Um, men wore trousers made of wool and a tunic which came down to their knees and women, women would wear a dress um, made of wool that went right down to the ground and Tudor children actually wore clothes which were very similar to their parents clothes but just smaller versions of those. So we've done you, um, I think you'll have to probably do this after the session if you feel like doing it, some, some colour and cut out um, Tudor um, characters that you can make. So this one is uh, uh, a lady, a fine rich Tudor lady um, and so you can see that she has her uh, bodice um, which goes on next to the skin and then the skirt with the hoops on it goes on next and then finally the dress with the rough um, collar and you can colour these in any colour you like but only purple if she's a queen and then we can see she has her um, headdress as well and we've got a man as well a Tudor man um, so he has all the things that a Tudor man would have worn. You can see his ruff there. So Tudor men wore tights, which were called hose. And those puffy shorts that you can see there, those are called a doublet that he would wear over the hose. And they would carry with them a dagger and a sword that they just as um, they would go around in court wearing those. So that's an activity that you can perhaps do um, in your own time. You've got some holiday time coming up, haven't you? So that might be something that you like to do. And finally, here's a little joke from us. So how does she look? Rough. <laughs> so that, that is because that frill that she has around her neck there is called a ruff. And that was one of the things that a, would, a rich person would wear, a ruff around the neck. And that was made out of lace that was stiffened. So it would stand up like that one. OK. So um, we're going to look next at, you know, we mentioned at the beginning that we had some, we have some royal charters here in the archives. And Gemma, um, my colleague, knows a lot about those. And she's going to tell you a little bit about them. So they're a part of our collections. In the archives here, we have documents going back um, well over a thousand years. Um, and we have the, the written record of Gloucestershire. And some of those documents are very beautiful. Some of them are very important. And um, Gemma's going to show you something now, which I think you will find interesting. So over to you, Gemma. So here we have one of the charters that we keep here at Gloucestershire Archives. So this is one that's about 500 years old and was written by King Henry VIII to the city of Gloucester. And it's called a charter. Now, if you're wondering what a charter is, uh, it's a legal document, so it's written in Latin. 
and it was telling the city of Gloucester what they could and couldn't do. So, for example, whether they were allowed to hold a market or to have a port. But the reason that we love this charter so much is that we've got this fantastic uh, decoration. So at the top, you can see it says Henricus, so for Henry. And in that nice big capital H, we can see an image of Henry and we can see him. He's slightly bigger than everybody else. Uh, partly he was a big man, but also it shows that he's more important than everybody else. And he's surrounded by his adoring advisors. And then if we move along a bit, we can see some other lovely decoration. We can see some Tudor roses, some strawberries, a lion. If we keep going across. We've got the Welsh dragon, which is lovely. Really a very beautiful charter. And I'll just show you the wax seal at the end. We'll talk about the wax seals a bit more in a moment. Thank you, Gemma. So Gemma's going to talk a little bit more about um, the wax seals. You, you, would, you saw a wax seal there. Gemma's going to have a, tell you a little bit more about those. But I just wanted to say, so um, if you wanted to come and have a look at things like those royal charters that we have here at the archives, get in touch with us because that's what we're for. We look after these records and the reason that we do that is so that people can come in and see them. Um, so uh, we're always very keen for people to come in and have a look at what we've got. So get in touch if you'd like to come and see some royal charters for yourself. So over to you, Gemma. Thanks, Kate. Um, so I just want to quickly show you the wax seals. Um, and the wax seals that you can see in front of you uh, are slightly better condition than the one that you just saw attached to the Henry VIII um, charter. Uh, the one that we have here is another item, another document that we have um, here in the archives. And you can see the wax seal attached. Uh, the brown bits where it's broken off a little bit. And what I've done is I've shown you um, by putting a couple of drawings up there what the image actually looks like. So if we look at the one on the left hand side, we can see it's an image of Henry VIII sat there as king with all the trappings of being a king, such as wearing the crown. And then the reverse of the wax seal, we can see um, Henry VIII in his most beloved position as a, a hunter. He was somebody who really enjoyed hunting. And you can see him there with his hunting dog and his horse. And so that would be what was on the reverse of this particular image uh, of this particular seal. And I just want to show you one other one, um, which really goes in with what Kate was just telling you about uh, royal portraits. And this is a letter from Elizabeth I. And you can see just on the left hand side, I've sort of blown up and made it black and white, the um, wax seal, so that you can get a, um, a slightly better idea, I hope, of um, how she looks on um, the wax seal. So you can see she's got that great big ruff around her neck. She's also got a big skirt and a very um, tiny waist. And the thing about wax seals is, is that we have a lot of them here in the archives and they tend to be quite small. They tend to be about the size of a 50p coin. Um, but wax seals, apparently, um, the size of them told you how important the pers person was. So the one that you can see in front of you is much bigger than a 50p coin. Um, this one and the Henry VIII ones are both about the size of a drinks coaster. So they in themselves will be telling you when you receive this letter or this charter would be telling you how incredibly important important they were. Um, and they worked a bit like a signature. Um, instead of sort of having to sign things off, you would press your your um, image into the wax, the hot wax, and you would end up with something like this. And then that way you would know who it was from. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Gemma. <laughs> okay, so um, the last thing that we're going to be thinking about and looking at today is about Tudor writing. So the most famous writer in the Tudor period was anybody? Okay, I'll give you a clue. There's his signature. Anybody know who that is? It's hard to read. Ah, uh, well done. Yep, Rafid's recognised the signature of William Shakespeare. And here we have his portrait. So w Shakespeare was alive in the Tudor period, and he was um, obviously the most famous writer of that time, S the most famous writer of any time, the person writing in English, at least, um, an extremely famous 
and well-known playwright and poet. Most people, as we know, couldn't write because they hadn't had very much education. People who could write would use a quill, um, which was um, a feather made from a, a, a feather from a large bird, like perhaps a swan or a goose, um, which would, the end was cut, cut into a sharp point and they would dip that into a pot of ink. Um, Tudor writing is very difficult for us to read because some of their letters are very different from modern writing. And they wrote in Latin um, to make things even more difficult. They didn't have fixed spellings like we do. So the same word, even somebody's name, could be spelt in several different ways. And Gemma told me earlier, I didn't know this, but William Shakespeare, apparently we have six surviving examples of his signature and each one is spelt slightly differently. So the idea of, of words being spelt in a, the same way every time was an idea that didn't exist at the time of the Tudors. Um, so we're going to have a little look at something now. This is the last slide um, of this presentation. Oh, and this is um, a nursery rhyme which has been written in Tudor writing. And Tudor writing, uh, the, the, the proper name for it is called Secretary Hand. And a lot of their letters were formed differently from our from our letters, and also the letters were formed differently depending on which letter came after them sometimes. So it's very difficult to read. Um, can anybody spot what this nursery rhyme is? Have a look at the top line. See if you can work out what's been written here, and you'll be starting to learn to read secretary hand. Just give you a minute or two to work it out. So can you see the first letter of the first word and the first letter of the last word are the same? Anybody want to have a go? Okay, I'll tell you then. Oh, hang on. Well done, Rafi. Yes, it is Sing a Song of Sixpence. Um, so you can see the capital S is at the beginning of so, sing and sixpence look the same. But it's a completely different letter at the start of the word song, isn't it? It looks more like an F. And that's because an S would look different if it had an I following it than if it had an O following it. So it's pretty difficult. Um, but anyway, so that's the whole of the nursery rum, sing a song of sixpence, written out there in secretary hand, in, in Tudor writing. So that's it from today about the Tudors. Unless you have any questions for us or anything else that, that you'd like to tell us, our next presentation is going to be the first Wednesday in July, which is July the 6th, and it's going to be our last one in this series. Um, we're going to have a break for the summer and then we're going to do um, events once a term, we think we're going to be doing more things here at the archives in our building and we're going to be doing an online event three times a year. Um, so the next one that we're doing is called Passport, it's called Pet Project and it's all about um, things that we have in the archives about people's pets. Uh, we've got lots of things about pet shows. There was a very famous gorilla who lived near Stroud who was called John Daniel. We'll be hearing about him. Um, we've got pictures of um, police dogs and shy horses and other animals that people look after. But what we especially want is to meet your pets. So we're hoping, we're hoping that we might have some pets of our own here um, with us at the archives and we would really love it if you could bring your pet to the session. If you can't, just tell us about your pet. And if you don't have a pet, if you have a toy that you look after, if you have a plant that you look after or a little bit of your garden, um, we want to hear about what you look after, please. So please bring those to, with you next time. So it's time for us to say goodbye unless anybody had anything they wanted to add. Doesn't look like it. Um, so let's um, have a big goodbye and a wave. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Thank, you for, thank you for joining us today. It was really lovely to have you. And we hope we'll see you next time. Um, and take care until then. And if you have anything you'd like to send us, um, there's our email address. Thank you very much.